All right, thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar. This is, of course, the second in your eight-part series to complement your in-person training for the Seattle Heritage Response Team. These programs are made possible through the generous grant funding support of the National Endowment for the Humanities. It's been a little while since the first webinar in your series about disaster fundraising. Today, we're discussing the very important topic of psychological considerations in disaster response, both for those who are affected by the disaster and for their responders. Next week, we'll explore a related topic, health and safety. Uh, we'll look at what hazards you'll face as well as what personal protective equipment you'll need. Beginning on August 22nd, we'll move into programs that address material specific salvage considerations. And uh, actually, the presenter of that program on August 22nd is joining us here today, David Goist, who will be speaking about painting salvage. We'll move on then to textiles, photos, and electronic media, book and paper, and then wooden and upholstered furniture. We'll wrap the final program on October 10th, which will be about three weeks before our final in-person meeting and disaster scenario training. If you miss any of these webinar sessions, I'll email you with a recording of the program after. Write to me when you've finished and I'll note your attendance. You'll be expected to complete all webinars before we meet again on November 1st. Before we begin today's presentation, I just wanted to share some brief technical notes. On your screen, you'll see several boxes, including one labeled chat on the left-hand side. I think most of you have found that. You can use that chat box to say hello and ask questions and share any information or links that you'd like. If you post a question in the chat box, you'll receive a response from me. Any questions will be noted, collected, and then I will verbally ask them of our presenter when she completes her remarks. You'll also see a box at the bottom of the screen titled Web Links. Simply click on one of these links to highlight it in blue, and then click the Browse To button at the bottom of the window in order to open the page. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce you all to our presenter, Dr. Jody Horstman. Dr. Horstman is a PhD, HSPP, and a licensed psychologist. She has 28 years of experience in community mental health, serving youth, adults, and families. In her current role at Aspire Indiana, she serves as Chief Clinical Officer. Prior to that, she served as Senior Director of Comprehensive Outpatient Services and Senior Director of Youth and Family Community Services. Since 2005, Dr. Horstman has taught courses on psychological first aid with the state of Indiana. She has been involved with multiple disaster mental health responses, both nationally and internationally. She served with the American Red Cross in New York following 9-11 as a part of the Indiana Task Force that assisted Mississippi following Hurricane Katrina and worked in Haiti following the 2010 earthquake. She is a member of Indiana's State Disaster Mental Health Team and a trainer of psychological first aid, also known as PFA. Dr. Horseman received her Bachelor of Arts degree in Behavioral Science from California State Polytechnical University and her Master of Arts and Doctoral degrees in Clinical Psychology from the United States International University in San Diego, California. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Jody Horseman. Okay, I think that I'm on now. So thank you very, very much for um, your patience. Uh, I can already tell that you guys are going to uh, be great responders because the first thing I look for in a responder, of course, is uh, the ability to adapt to the situation and to um, be flexible and adaptive. So uh, appreciate, really appreciate your patience um, so far as we work through those bugs. Uh, so thank you and thank you, Jessica, for um, your introduction. I, I appreciate that. It's always odd to listen to someone uh, talk about you. But uh, I also want to point out, uh, you never know really when uh, some of these skills are going to come into um, into play or when you may be uh, called upon to utilize them. So uh, I reside I reside in Indianapolis. However, um, I work in Noblesville, Indiana, and some of you uh, may have heard of Noblesville recently because we had a school shooting. And uh, I was able to uh, train some of my staff that had not been trained in uh, psychological first aid and we were able to um, quickly get up to speed in terms of responding to that school shooting. So uh, psychological first aid, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, is uh, very adaptive and very flexible to all sorts of situations. And so I'm really glad that you all uh, have taken the opportunity to be able to uh, learn a little bit more about that. OK, so I, I believe I am driving now. Yes, so this is our agenda, and we still have plenty of time, so there's really uh, this, our technical difficulties have not cut into uh, the presentation time. We're going to just talk a little bit about um, disaster overview, uh, just to kind of give you some context and some definitions, then move into the psychological consequences of disasters, uh, talk just a bit about some special population 
considerations, uh, the needs of su survivors and responders, and then some of the guiding principles of psychological first aid. And then uh, what I like to think of really is one of the most important parts, and that's self-care. Um, and, and recognizing when you uh, need to take care of yourself, how you need to take care of yourself, because just like um, you watch on an airplane, you know, when the mask drops, it's important to put your own mask on first so that you are then able to assist others. So that kind of gives you an idea what we're going to talk about. So uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is resilience. And the reason that I talk about that first is because um, we often underestimate it. We hear a lot about um, trauma and about people's response and traumatic reactions or post-traumatic stress disorder. What we don't necessarily hear so much about is resilience. And resilience is, is really the ability to bounce back and to move forward. Uh, it reflects an ability to maintain a stable equilibrium in the face of obstacles, difficulties, problems, um, crises. What we don't appreciate often is that resilience is very common. And mental health workers, like myself, typically uh, underestimate that. That's not what we're trained to recognize. We're <laughs> trained to look for problems. Uh, and sometimes when people don't present with uh, with difficulties following a, a crisis or a disaster, we misinterpret that. And uh, that's the same reason that uh, psychological first aid and disaster response does not always call for uh, a licensed or, or a trained mental health responder. And psychological first aid is really designed for, uh, for your neighbor, for your fellow church member, for family members, and so this is, this is uh, certainly applicable to you. We hear a lot about um, post-traumatic stress disorder. About 85% of American adults will have uh, been exposed to a potentially traumatic event. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. Um, but really, only about 8% ever develop any uh, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. That doesn't even mean a full uh, diagnostic meeting of the criteria, but you think about that. So the majority of us as, as adults will have, and if, if you think back into your life, right, you have been exposed most likely to uh, a traumatic or potentially traumatic event, uh, and, but that does not mean that you have uh, developed uh, symptoms related to that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what happens in a critical event. And then we're going to talk a little bit um, about some other definitions. So when there is a critical event, and that's usually uh, reflective of that there is some significant loss, right? Um, the thing, what we often don't anticipate or don't appreciate, unless you have some experience in looking at, or in or being involved in a, a broad disaster is really the, the extent of the loss that occurs. So this list is really uh, meant to bring to mind, top of mind, all the different things that we're talking about here. So potentially you may have lost loved ones or people that you care about or people that you know. Certainly we often see that people have lost material goods. What we often don't appreciate or understand is that employment people's financial stability um, is often uh, impacted here. Their uh, ability to feel safe, the, the social cohesion of a, a community or an organization can often be impacted. Uh, our own self-image. So I'm going to show you some um, pictures. And these here are from uh, Katrina. So when we arrived at Katrina, uh, this, these are some of the scenes that we saw. And uh, when you think about our support systems and the things that we typically turn to, uh, people, places, um, social supports, that when things go poorly in our life, where, where do we look? And oftentimes that is our, our, our spiritual, spirituality or uh, a religious um, institution or relationships that we have there and, and appreciating that those may not be there. Uh, yeah, after a disaster situation. 
you also think about, um, you know, if you had a fire in your house or your basement flooded or something like that, you, you know, the first thing you might think of is, well, I'm going to need to go and stay in a hotel room or I'm only going to go and stay with a friend or, or a relative. So in a broad scale disaster, those options may not be available to you. This was uh, one of the hotels, or a motel that was close to where we were camped, which was actually on, a, on the parking lot of what used to be the convention center. So that uh, kind of, so that, that um, your ability to access those types of supports may not be there. We may not be able to get somewhere. Uh, one of the things we we don't anticipate sometimes is uh, just because we take it for granted is I can get from one place to another, or I can I can go and I can pick up my medication, or I can go to the grocery store. Um, this would have been the grocery store. So the ability to go and and pick up some of those essentials or um, have access to some of the things that you might normally want may not be there. So what exactly is a crisis? A crisis is um, really something that occurs that exceeds the resources that we have available in the moment. And so that that's part of what makes this very unique per individual and where we often misunderstand and get frustrated with each other. So let me give you an example. If I have, uh, if I'm on my way to work and I have one vehicle uh, and I get a flat tire on the way to work, if I have uh, the insurance or AAA or I have the money to get that that fixed or that repaired or or have someone come do that, that may not be a crisis for me. If, however, I don't have that resource, I don't have those funds, I don't have um, the ability to reach out and and get that assistance, that may very well be a crisis for me. So it's really individualized. Whenever we are faced with a situation, I mean, we're carrying some stress. We're carrying some things that are on our mind. Some of us may be uh, dealing with financial situations, or we may be dealing with uh, relationship issues, or maybe we've lost our job. Those are uh, events, those are problems that we are carrying with us that are that are utilizing our resources. So depending on how much you carry, you're carrying that with you or the people that you're talking to have been carrying that. Um, one more event that may not seem like a big deal to you from externally may be kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back. That it just exceeded the resource and so that person is having and experiencing a legitimate crisis. Trauma, on the other hand, is, is not a particular event. Trauma is our perception um, and experience of the event. Trauma actually is not so much a rational, logical experience as much in, as an emotional and biological experience. So think of it as uh, an event occurs to such extent that in, in our minds that the actual uh, event itself and the emotional experience of that are almost not connected. So we are stunned like a bolt out of the blue. It feels us, it leaves us feeling overwhelmed. It, it, we're disconnected. Oftentimes our emotional, um, and we'll talk about some of the other reactions, don't logically fall in line with, uh, with what actually happened or our memory of the event. And so trauma typically uh, is related to things like um, events that may have, I'm sorry, may have uh, put us at risk of lo significant loss, um, physical injury, or death, if either ourselves or someone that we care about. Reactions to trauma uh, are a process. They are not an event. So when someone has had a traumatic situation, or experience, simply talking to them one time or kind of having them, you know, talk it out is just not going to be enough. Our coping with trauma is going to take a period of time 
over which those those experiences and our memories kind of reintegrate. So what are some of the psychological consequences of disasters? First, let's talk about the psychological footprint. So um, psychological footprint refers to uh, the impact of that disaster um, or that event from a psychological versus a medical footprint or medical aspect. So when you see um, a widespread disaster, say uh, the flooding this year, this past year, uh, that parts of the United States experienced, right? So what, what you will often hear about in the news is the financial kind of like the cost. Um, this, is what, uh, this is what this disaster is estimated to have cost, uh, or this is how many people have been injured or have been killed. What we don't hear about is the psychological footprint. And this, this picture on here uh, is really to represent how those two things compare. The medical footprint tends to be much, much smaller than the psychological footprint. So we talk about hospital surge, for example. So let's say that there is um, an event where maybe something happened at a school and parents don't know where their children are. So we may have had one injury, or in particular in this, this last incident that I referred to, we had two injuries, um, yet we had thousands of people show up, right? Because they didn't know what was going on. And so that also happens when there's uh, a disaster and there's medical um, issues. So there may be very few people that are injured, but where do you go when you don't know what has happened to your loved one? you typically go to the hospital if there's not communication. So hospitals are often inundated with what we call surge, which are people that are showing up um, wanting information, which overwhelms the medical staff. Uh, but these are equally as valid, these reactions. We have people that show up feeling ill uh, related to anxiety or um, fear, right? Just fear that maybe they've been exposed. So one example of this is um, the anthrax. So back in 2001, if you think about um, after 9-11, how many folks uh, developed some kind of anxiety related to uh, potentially being exposed to anthrax. So there were actually 22 direct casualties, yet our entire mail system, um, our medical system, our hospital system were inundated uh, and their functioning impaired by people's psychological responses to, uh, to this issue. And this is one of the things that illustrates the importance of being able to do some type of psychological response to folks that don't require medical professionals, right? To be able to have those conversations, to be able to intervene uh, and know how to do that comfortably uh, so that people can begin to resolve these without um, necessarily seeking uh, formal interventions or um, Im impacting the functioning of other resources. Uh, these are some pictures of uh, Haiti after the earthquake. So one of the things in a widespread disaster uh, is that we, um, and it, it, the entire infrastructure needs to be rebuilt. So at Katrina, um, and in Haiti uh, are good, both good examples where the infrastructure, the, the government, the community, the agencies that we um, anticipate being there to support us, to guide us, to provide uh, that response frequently are not available. So we know now that uh, the recommendation is that if there is a disaster that you, each of us as individuals should be able to and be prepared to uh, basically care for ourselves for a minimum of 72 hours. So ourselves and our families. So we should have our own disaster kits. We should have our own resources, our own plans of communication uh, in order to do that because it may very well take uh, 72 hours or more for uh, 
um, a, an emergency response to be uh, brought to bear and for, those, for that assistance to occur. Basic services are impacted. So this is a pile of trash, basically, uh, because there was no trash uh, cleanup. There was no, there was rubble. There, people are living day to day, and this is basically piled up in the middle of the street. And if you look at the umbrellas behind that, that is the food, those are the food stands. People are, are selling food right there. So you can think about, you can see how um, the disruption of the infrastructure then can bring about even more disaster or uh, more crises as uh, disease may be spread or infection. Basic housing. So this is a tent city. I think most people have seen something like this uh, in term, like on the news or in pictures. Um, and so this, this was widespread. People had nowhere to go. And if they did have somewhere to go, those buildings weren't necessarily safe. And then just basically attending to, to your basic needs. So this was uh, clean water. And you can see that people had lined up their uh, containers to be able to access that clean water. So things that we typically take for granted um, are things that, and, and it doesn't really necessarily enter our awareness that a, a widespread disaster could take those things away from us. So what are the phases of disaster? So this is a, um, a chart that uh, was developed to really kind of illustrate uh, the phases that, pe that people, communities, agencies, uh, in, in geographic areas uh, experience uh, it, when a disaster occurs. And it's surprisingly consistent across all of those different um, aspects. So it could be this, a, a person could experience this, your agency could experience this, your community could experience this. So the line represents basically functioning. So pre-disaster, we have a fairly straightforward level of functioning. Uh, there's some warning. It starts to, uh, functioning starts to drop. There's the actual impact. So that would be the, that first dip. And then what's called the heroic phase. So the heroic phase is when uh, friends, neighbors, emergency responders, uh, the community comes together and they are helping each other. And in widespread disasters, this is where, you know, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, um, religious organizations are, are, are mounting teams to respond, that there's money coming in from FEMA, um, there's shelters set up, there are um, family assistance centers set up, there's all sorts of disaster response that's occurring. And you can see that, the, the, that this uh, functioning level climbs here. I mean, a community that's um, at the, the heart of such support, yes, that feels good. Um, people are doing some amazing things. And then you see that it, that it tops out at some point, which is what happens because eventually folks, um, the, another disaster occurs or they've responded and now they get, need to get back to their, to their home or to their job and that cannot continue for a period of time. However, uh, so we call this the honeymoon, so that we have a really uh, kind of cohesive experience, and then people leave, and that is hard, and often unanticipated by the people, by the communities and, and people that are impacted by the disasters. So then you see this functioning level drop, and you see the word disillusionment, because people get really, uh, truly disillusioned by this they uh, have felt like there was, there was gonna be all this help and it is very, very common for people in communities to believe that, it, okay, everything's just gonna go back to normal, but that is absolutely not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that they're going to establish a new normal, uh, but that's a hard process. So people often feel abandoned, people feel angry, irritable. Um, uh, responders are often at this point kind of targets of anger because people are, uh, need someone safe to be able to um, kind of vent that to. And then there's this long period and it's extended um, and it can go beyond three years. It can go for years and years uh, in terms of reconstruction where the community has to establish 
that new normal. They have to weather those anniversary reactions or trigger events as they come up. And, um, and you can see that it's a, it's a long, uh, difficult process. And we see, you know, Haiti, Katrina, uh, that, that those, those communities still have not recovered. So who's potentially impacted? Well, it's not just the people that were necessarily geographically there. It is their family members. It could be their friends who are uh, maybe live across the country that are concerned about them. It could be their coworkers. It is definitely the emergency responders, and it could be anyone who is a witness to that. So I'd like you to remember back to 9/11 when we all saw those videos of the of the planes hitting the towers, and uh, they played that again and again for an extended period of time, right? Uh, and you think about directly how many individuals were impacted by that. Um, either they were physically present or they were, uh, uh, or they were there as a witness to that. And then what the ripple effect of that was across our country. So oftentimes the potential psychological impact or footprint can extend well beyond uh, the geographic area that it occurred. So, <clears throat> what, Yeah, I think um, a we just lost. So, so a disaster, disaster is, uh, is a sudden calamitous event that seriously disrupts the functioning of a community or a society and causes human material and economic or environmental losses that exceed the community or society's ability to cope using its own resources. Okay, Jody, do you want to just try testing again? I hope you can still hear me okay, but you cut out at the beginning of that last slide. So I'm still not hearing anything from Jody. Um, let me try typing to see if something comes through. I'm not sure if there was a disconnect. We might just need to have her log out and log back in again. Yeah, Jody. it looks, it seems like your microphone says it's picking up, but there's still nothing. So if you don't mind logging out, um, as soon as you log back in, I will bump you up to presenter again. Thank you. Thanks everyone for your patience.
Okay, let's try this again. Jody's back in, and I think we lost you here on the slide, Jody. So I'm going to mute my. Okay. Well, let me make sure that you can hear me. We can. You sound good. Thank you. Okay. Great. All right. So, uh, what I was saying on this slide was that a disaster for uh, is is like uh, a crisis for for a person. A disaster is that for a community. So it's a sudden calamitous event that seriously disrupts the functioning of the community that, ex that exceeds the community's or society's ability to cope using its own resources. So uh, that's one way to think of a disaster versus a crisis. So let's talk a little bit about what are um, some of the uh, impacts of a disaster. So we know that there's basically five areas in which someone will um, experience some type of reaction. And everybody experiences something, but not everyone will experience everything and not, not necessarily experience, experience something to the degree that it's going to interfere with their day-to-day -day functioning. So there is a very individualized response to this. Um, it's going to, the psychological distress is going to be uh, related to a few different variables. One is your closest closeness to the event and your the intensity of the exposure. So some of the things that can be of assistance in coping with a disaster is that you may have had prior experience with some, some type of event similar and have gotten through that and have built some coping skills uh, related to that. You may, <clears throat> it may be that the resources that are available for that particular individual, like we talked about before, some people, their resources are really tied up um, already with issues or difficulties in their life. And is this just, you know, that tipping point? If you are working as a responder in an area that is your own neighborhood, for example, or it's uh, the disaster has impacted people that you know, we know that that um, increases your reaction to, uh, to the event. So let's talk for a second about what our brains do when uh, there's a disaster. So our brains are complex and uh, our brains have developed a very complex and, and involuntary method of keeping us safe. So our attention um, is, the way our brains are biologically designed is, is that our brains look for, a portion of our brain, the amygdala, is looking for threats. It's always constantly scanning for threats. And when uh, our attention is, is directed to something that we perceive as a potential threat, then um, our brain is almost hijacked by that. And there's a whole range of different things that occur. Our bodies prepare for fight, flight, or freeze, right? Our attention narrows to that threat, which often means that we are not able then to um, take in or, or even aware of positive events or things that may um, contra uh, contradict what we perceive as a threat. Positive information can be filtered out and we lose the ability to um, creatively problem solve or um, even sometimes logically work through something. So now this is not unique to a disaster, okay? This is about how our brains respond in terms of threat. So you can also, um, apply the same premise to, you know, if you're watching a news channel every night that's telling you how terrible something is, your brain is experiencing that as real and all those things are still happening. In a disaster, of course, this is that on steroids. So some of the things that occur uh, uh, in terms of physical and behavioral reactions uh, are that uh, we may experience things like loss of appetite, headaches or chest pain, um, GI problems, uh, sometimes a hyperactivity or just feeling like uh, jittery, like you got to be moving. Um, there is a, a tendency for people who have experienced a disaster to, especially if they previously have used this as a coping mechanism, to increase drug or alcohol consumption. We know that these are common reactions. So there is there is nothing in and of themselves 
wrong or abnormal about these reactions, okay? These are normal reactions to an abnormal situation. It's part of how we're designed. We may experience nightmares, insomnia, fatigue, oftentimes people who have a pre-existing uh, physical condition, whether it's GI or arthritis or something like that, um, experience a re-emergence of this. Sometimes people engage in some uh, high-risk sexual behavior. People may also tend to become very irritable or angry. Um, they can be blaming toward others or blaming toward themselves. Some people tend to want to withdraw. Others tend to um, want to, to uh, not be by themselves. Oftentimes, very, very common reaction is that people are afraid that this is going to occur again, or they become hypervigilant, right, to uh, that something something else is going to happen, which makes perfect sense because we live our lives in a state of denial to some extent. We basically uh, wouldn't be able to leave our house if we thought of all the terrible things that could possibly happen to us. So we kind of screen those out. We don't, um, we don't think about those. But when a, when a disaster occurs, that sense of safety and denial is just very um, harshly ripped away. And so all those uh, potential bad things that could happen are now top of mind. Uh, and so that feeling of safety that we live with on a daily basis is gone. And people, of course, are very anxious about that. One of the things that can occur sometimes is that people feel uh, what we call a, a cascade of emotions. So not necessarily uh, in any logical order, not necessarily connected to a particular event. Uh, it could be that all of a sudden they feel like crying, or all of a sudden that they're angry, or all of a sudden they feel a lot of different things, and nothing has necessarily occurred to trigger that. It's just kind of this, um, this cascade that comes over, very common. Uh, concentration and memory problems. I just talked to you a little bit about how the brain works. So it makes a lot of sense. Our attention's been hijacked. We're very hypervigilant, we're very aware, and um, being able to follow a, a conversation or multi-step task, it sometimes becomes very difficult. Relationship problems can become an issue, um, so we see uh, long term some issues in terms of um, divorce and things like that. Oftentimes there's some spiritual issues as well as people question. Uh, some people are uh, that uh, faith is very important to them are driven are driven deeper and they become more connected to their spirituality or their faith. Others start to question like how could this happen? So these are all common things that you may see in folks that you talk to or you may experience yourself because as a responder in a disaster situation, you also have become a survivor of that disaster. So, and we, sometimes we fail to appreciate that, um, but, but you are also experiencing some of those things firsthand, but also secondhand, vicariously through the stories that, or the people, uh, people that you're interacting with. So anything that I just listed here that other people may experience, a responder may also experience. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about psychological first aid then. So psychological first aid is uh, endorsed by the World, World Health Organization as uh, a way to reduce initial distress caused by traumatic events and to foster adaptive functioning. So one of the nice things about psychological first aid is that it's very um, nimble. It's very adaptable. So you can, uh, you can use it in all sorts of situations with all sorts of types of folks. So I've, I've done this in Haiti. Uh, in a tent city, I've done it uh, formally, you know, in a school. I've done it in groups. I've done it in people's yards where I, neighbors have gathered, and I did, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to people about that um, just, you know, spontaneously. <clears throat> uh, so and that basically uh, talks about that in that slide. So there's some core actions here, and we're not going to go 
really deep and broad into psychological first aid because those links that that uh, Jessica had mentioned earlier that are at the bottom of your screen, those are two links where you can go online and actually um, get the training. It's an interactive training uh, on how to do psychological first aid and it has some great vignettes and things like that. So if this is something that you're interested in, I would highly encourage that. Um, and it, you never, like I said, you never know uh, when you might be called upon to utilize that, whether it's with your neighbor or um, someone else that you know. So the core, uh, the core actions for psychological first aid are basically, and uh, are these eight, and I'm, Okay, are we still here? So, uh, so I had another link pop up there. Uh, the first one of these is by far the hardest. So this is um, making contact and engaging survivors. Socially, this, is, this feels very awkward for folks. And it's really just about um, reaching out to folks and having just a, a natural conversation Hey, I've noticed you sitting here. How's it going? Oh, you know, what, what has, uh, what has your experience been? Can I, basic things, can I get you, can I get you some water? Um, how's your day been? What's, what's on your mind today? Just simple kinds of conversations. It does not have to be this formal approach to um, having some kind of intervention with someone. So I, I by far, for my mental health providers, this is um, this is the most awkward thing for them to do because they're used to having a more formal setting. The second thing is really providing safety and comfort for someone because they're not going to be able to move forward uh, in having a conversation if they feel unsafe or incredibly uncomfortable in this particular situation. So, like I said, holding uh, just holding someone's place in line while they go to the bathroom or uh, getting someone some water, any of those basic kinds of things. Um, assisting in stabilization is really about um, just helping people um, recognize that this is, this is probably a long-term process. Um, what are their immediate needs? We, for example, we, we had an individual who was who came to a family assistance center and uh, my responder came back to me and said, I have, uh, I don't know what to do. This person lost their home. It's been flooded and they, um, they have insurance, they have money, they have access to the bank, they have a car, uh, but they're sitting here and they don't, they, and they're not sure why. Well, that goes back to what I was talking about before that we're not necessarily thinking very clearly when we're overwhelmed. So it was really about kind of just, hey, so let's talk about what it is that you might need and what your next steps might be. And that's all that that person needed was really to have someone sit with them and talk uh, and, and let let him bounce that off. Um, oh, yeah, I could. I, yes, I could get a hotel. Oh, yes, my insurance will cover that. Um, and just giving him a sense of direction. So it was just kind of stabilizing where he was gathering some information about his current needs and then offering some practical assistance. So, do, you know, do you know, do you, do you know where to go uh, to, to get a, a hotel room? What are, what, what are some of the, some rooms that are available in this particular area? Things like that. Um, oftentimes information just about um, what's going on because the first thing that goes out the window in a disaster is accurate information and as human beings we have a tendency to if we don't have information we'll make it up and then we'll spread it as if it's true and um, I don't know why we do that as a human being but uh, that's what we do we tend to fill in the gaps I guess it makes it makes it us feel better but at the same time uh, often spreads misinformation so just giving people some accurate information about what's going on. And if someone says, I, I, you know, I, I need to know about this and you don't know, being honest about it and just saying, well, 
Uh, I don't know that, but let me see if I can go ask. Reconnecting with social supports. So earlier we talked about crisis, and the first thing that goes out of the window when you experience a crisis is your memory of all the things that um, that you've brought to bear in the past to be successful with problems and obstacles. So because at this moment we're feeling overwhelmed, like our resources uh, are inadequate to meet our needs, and we forget. We forget we've dealt with all sorts of things in our life and been successful at it. Things that at the time felt overwhelming then too. So helping people reconnect to their social supports, to their own coping skills, reminding them of times or asking them uh, about times that they've been successful in the past and how they've handled things can be really, really valuable. Information on distress rate actions and coping. Those are some of the things I just um, talked to you about, the psychological, physical, cognitive, spiritual, um, so that people, it normalizes that for folks so that they don't have to feel like there's something wrong with them. We have a tendency to, um, to have these reactions. Like I said earlier, some people will uh, experience some. Everybody's going to be impacted in some way. But if we think that there's something wrong with us by feeling this or experiencing this, and then we don't say anything, and then we become more anxious because we think there's something wrong with us, then it just builds and it becomes exponential. So basically having some information about, hey, guess what? This is a really common reaction that people that people experience can really go a long way in helping people kind of regroup and then linking them with any of the services um, or needs that uh, or agencies that could meet their needs um, in the area is is the last uh, core action so you can see that none of the, none of those actions require a degree or formal training they're all things that any of us can do for our neighbor or someone um, that we can that we just care for. So psychological first aid really talks about, um, it, it's really about respectful listening. So there's models out there like uh, critical incident step, stress debriefing where um, there's a series of steps and things have to go in a certain order and people, ha there's rules about participating. Uh, but psychological first aid is a great um, model because it's really about letting people tell their story and it's in any order that they want starting wherever they want and what it does and what the research has shown is that as people get to tell their story that disconnect between that that those those really um, overwhelming emotions and the things that happen start to reconnect in our brains they start to link back together in a way that that our brains can make sense of and that's the part that really starts to decrease um, our reactivity or our, our some of the things that we may be experiencing. So it's really about letting people tell their story. Kids do this naturally. When something kind of scary happens to them, they will tell you again and again and again until you're tired of hearing about it. But um, it's actually very adaptive. They are doing exactly what they should be doing and it helps them uh, just in the same way that psychological first aid does. It's also very sensitive to culture. So when we when we uh, are responding anywhere, uh, these are the things that we want to be be sensitive to. Is there a particular culture, a sub a subculture? Um, in in Katrina, there was uh, I didn't I didn't realize a lot of people didn't realize that there are a lot of Vietnamese fishermen fishermen fisher people with boats doing a lot of shrimp. Uh, shrimping, is, I guess, is the term, and um, there was so there was a whole culture, a whole uh, different language that uh, was used there that I, I was unaware of at the time, and so you know some adaptation had to occur to help engage those folks. Um, sometimes religious diversity, um, certainly being aware of our own language, our own implicit bias, our own assumptions, um, is very helpful. So what do people need? And I, I'm going to go back real quick. So this is needs of survivors and responders, right? So this is both. <laughs> because as I said before, as a responder, you are now a survivor. <clears throat> Notice that we do not use the term victim. Victim has negative connotations. Uh, if something has been done to you, right? You're the recipient, kind of oftentimes a passive, helpless recipient. 
A survivor is someone uh, that has experienced something but is overcoming it, has uh, experienced it and, and, and is moving through it. So you can see just the importance of using language. And this gets, okay, so this gets back to some of those core actions. First thing is to feel safe and secure, to have their base, have their or your basic survival needs met, the ability to tell the story, just like we talked about, and to reconnect <clears throat> with um, the the coping skills that they've used in the past, and some, and some, maybe learn some new ones, right? So because resilience, uh, what we're doing is we're engaging people's previous resilience skills. And resilience not only helps us uh, bounce back and move forward, but it builds what we call protective factors um, so that the next time something really um, <clears throat> intense happens to us or we're, uh, have, we have a traumatic event or a crisis situation, that we have those skills built. We know we have those skills built. And the way that we approach it is oftentimes can be in a way that uh, minimizes the impact that it may have on us. Okay, so I talked a little bit about this already. Um, so we are, what we're looking at here is really connecting to people uh, in a calm manner, in an empowering manner. Uh, I once had a professor tell me that if I did nothing else, helping people feel hopeful uh, was one of the most powerful things that I can do because if people don't have hope, then um, there really is nowhere to go. <clears throat> when you communicate with people who have experienced a disaster, um, using clear language, short, simple sentences, very direct. Remember, memory and uh, problem solving, logical, sequential tasks become much more difficult. That is uh, one of the most common reactions that people have after a disaster. And so you may have a whole conversation with someone. And as a matter of fact, I did this once. I had this whole conversation with someone. I thought it went brilliant. Uh, I, I thought my intervention was great. I just was made so much sense and um, was feeling really good about myself. And at the end of that, I, I asked them, so do you understand? And they went back and, and asked me why I was why I felt it was important to talk about that to begin with. So they missed the entire thing. I'd only impressed myself. Uh, it, was one of, it was a great learning experience that uh, I really just need to keep it short and simple. And maybe it's not so much about me, maybe it's about them. <clears throat> also in communicating, because culturally, this oftentimes feels very odd. Um, and we don't know what to say when people are experiencing loss or, or grief or things like that. So we kind of come up with some platitudes. And so this is a, just a slide to let you know there's some things that it's better to say nothing than to say some of these things. Because oftentimes these things feel like, <clears throat> while they sound like they might be supportive, is often perceived by that person as minimizing um, or glossing over the impact of, what, of, of their experience. So, <clears throat> responder, self-care. Let's remember I said this is one of the most important things. There are times that you may be asked if you can go respond. And that needs to be uh, a, a decision that you evaluate carefully because there may be things going on in your life that uh, you would not be the best person given the amount of resource that you have engaged or tied up in some things going on in your own life uh, for for you to be able to respond because you are going to have to be under uh, managing a, not only your own stress but of the impact of, of the people that you're working with as well or that you run across. <clears throat> we often have a tendency to um, what we call have cognitive distortions which is really some psychobabble uh, for we get a little grandiose we often think that um, that I, I, you know, I, I can't leave because there's still things to be done. Um, maybe this other person, I'm the only one that understands this. Um, I'm the one that needs to talk to this person because I, I have a relationship and they, uh, these other people 
uh, they won't understand them as well as I do or they won't be able to help them as much as I do. That's a common distortion a com of thinking that responders will feel because people that are kind of driven to help others, um, that's that feels good. And when we um, can't do that, it uh, it doesn't feel good. When you know when you have to leave and you know it's not done, or there's things unfinished or things that you can't help with, then um, that is difficult. So that sense of I can do it better or it's got to be me uh, is just something to be aware of. Building your own resiliency, taking a look at the things that you do, the coping skills that keep you centered and uh, manage your stress. Having a plan and identifying your own re uh, resources pre-deployment. So have you had this conversation with your family that you may go off and do this or um, or with your teammates that um, during the deployment, how, how are things impacting you? How are people, uh, your interactions with people impacting you, monitoring each other, <clears throat> both there and when you get back, giving somebody permission to be able to um, check in with you when you get back. Responders have a tendency to be a little closed mouth about some of this because other people do air, air quotations, um, don't understand because they weren't there. <clears throat> that is, on some level is true. Oftentimes when you respond in a disaster, you uh, develop a very strong relationship um, and connection with the people that you have deployed with or respond with uh, because they're experiencing some very emotional, emotionally intense things as well as you are, and there's a there's a level of, of understanding that is present that is not present for people who weren't there. Be aware of that because that can be a real wedge between um, yourself and your friends, colleagues, significant others, spouses when you come back. So um, having those discussions um, both before and after you come back are really important. <clears throat> It's really important to, to attend to yourself and to, um, to know when you need to take a break and to be, be flexible about things. My first response was to 9-11. I spent my first two and a half days doing nothing. That is very common. Uh, there's a lot of need. There's a lot of things that need to happen. You can see it. You, want, you might be frustrated that uh, these things need to happen. And some of you may have experienced this in the past as well. Um, that, but you can't get to it because the organizational infrastructure of it is not, uh, has not been identified or it's not been set up. It's very common to, um, by the time the information gets, comes in and the decision is made as to what's going to happen next, that the situation has changed. So that uh, I take cards, a book, whatever, and I learn to be able to take naps and to um, not get so frustrated if it, things aren't going the way that I, I think that they should. <clears throat> a debriefing is, uh, we require that for, for our teams, and that is uh, a brief discussion of much like psychological first aid for, uh, for the responders to kind of put things in order, to talk about your experiences, to talk about things that may be coming up, how you might process that, who you want to tell your story to, who you don't want to tell your story to, um, how to, to really focus on your own self-care when you get home. Uh, those are all really important things for you to do. We all know that exercise uh, and sleep are really important, so attending to those. Uh, eating healthy, I know I'm starting to sound like an advertisement at this point, but it's true. All these things are really connected to our mood and to our ability to um, to function. What are some of the things that you might keep an eye out for? Um, like I said before, if, if you're someone who uses substances, whether it's alcohol or something else, cigarettes, what, whatever, um, to, uh, to chill out or to calm your nerves or to, um, to kind of mellow out or whatever, you may be prone to continue to use that and may increase use. Um, difficulty relaxing or resting. Um, that hypervigilance that we talked about before uh, is going to be true. So recognizing that that's a common reaction, that, um, that you may be experiencing 
and you might need to talk to some folks about uh, you might have a, a kind of a large startle reaction to a loud noise or someone stopping by your office or something like that. Um, headaches are, are pretty common uh, or just a change in activity level. So those are common. If you find that they're going on for a period of time and are starting to kind of interfere, uh, that can be, you know, that may be something that you just want to talk about. You can have a debriefing with someone. Um, or it, it could be that uh, maybe you're not the person that's recognizing that. So one of the things that we often do in post-deployment as we plan ahead is to have give, give someone permission to bring those things to our attention so that it's, um, I'm not necessarily going to agree with them, but my, uh, my commitment will be that I will um, listen to them and I will at least go and think about it. All right, so to summarize, psychological first aid um, addresses those immediate needs. The goal is to decrease uh, the impact uh, in all those five domains, the, the behavioral, psychological, emotional, cognitive, spiritual um, domains, so that, uh, that we kind of integrate those experiences, uh, the emotional part with the logical sequential experience of what, of what occurred. Uh, and that um, it lowers the risk of uh, kind of traumatic symptoms, traumatic response sim symptoms as it goes on. We're connecting survivors, we're empowering survivors. Um, we are helping them rediscover um, their strengths to stabilize themselves, to get their basic needs met, um, reconnect with their social supports. And again, taking an active role. So they, they are survivors, they are actively working um, on overcoming this, so no one's doing it for them. No one is telling, is giving them the message that they can't do it or that we don't believe that they can do it. All right, and then this is uh, what I talked about a few minutes ago, and these are um, the two website links where someone uh, can go and you can actually take the course. It's free. Um, looks like you do not uh, need a specific logon to be able to do that. You can just sign up. It's been a little bit since I've been on there myself, but I, when I looked at these um, the last time, they they were very cleverly done and very, actually very entertaining as you did it. So at that point, I am going to open this up to any questions that you might have. I think um, we made it for some lost time, and so I was able to get all the content in. So I'd be happy to answer some questions. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jody. Um, such a fantastic presentation and really hit on a lot of very important points um, for this group to be aware of. I want to um, encourage you all to drop any questions that you might have there in the chat window. Uh, I'd also like to ask for the representative from the UW Libraries and Henry Art Gallery, if you could just uh, quickly type up the list of the folks who are there watching this um, with your little viewing party, because I just want to make sure that I have uh, all of the attendance marked there. So if you could do that as well, that would be very helpful. Um, but I will say that when we did the debriefings with those um, members of the National Heritage Responders that we sent to Puerto Rico um, to help with recovery efforts after Maria, the, the psychological aspect of their work was something that they hit on over and over again, and how important it was to be good listeners and to respect um, the needs of the survivors to really tell their story. So a lot of what Jody said in this presentation uh, echoes with the, the firsthand experiences of people who are working to help save cultural heritage. Um, so I see Corey is typing a question there, so I'm just going to hold tight to see um, when that comes through. Uh, I also want to go ahead and take this opportunity to thank you all for your patience with the technical issues. And Jody, I think I was the one who caused the other window to pop up on your screen. So sorry about that. Um, but thank you for all for holding tight during um, the audio issues to start off. Okay, and thank you to the folks at UW. Um, I will make sure that I mark that attendance. So Corey is wondering, can you address the issue of authority, i.e. who is in charge in a pre-disaster situation? Are the responders giving uh, psychological first aid only those designated somehow and thereby recognized as the authorities, or is the psychological first aid for anyone to give? If so, does that lead to problems of, quote, who is in charge? She meant post-disaster. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. That makes sense. Um, so yeah, if you could speak to maybe the um, authority figures post-disaster. 
Uh, sure, that's a great question. So, um, boy, Corey sounds like maybe uh, there's been some involvement in a disaster before. So, <laughs> uh, this is this is a this is a truism for uh, for disaster response, and that is disasters tend to be a, a political event in in many ways, and so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I saw. I see that, Corey. Uh, and so there is a lot. Unfortunately, you would you would, in our minds, we we think that everybody's just going to come together and help, and and everybody wants to do that. But systems are set up to to help people, but our each system tends to believe that that their way of helping people is is probably the best way. And so, unfortunately, um, there tends to be a lot of conf confusion miscommunication, and sometimes some conflict related to um, authority. So if you are responding specifically as a um, responder for, for you all, as, as you uh, respond and you have a job to do, psych psychological first aid is really just a method of interacting with the folks around you. Um, if you are responding a uh, as a responder specific to do psychological first aid that typically should fall um, as uh, you will fall into a hierarchy of folks and there is uh, something called NIMS which is the National Incident Management System um, that those of us that that respond um, do mental health response and things like that um, that we have to be trained in that that's a there's a whole chain of command that goes and in, goes uh, into that, and so um, you have your own role, and you also have someone who is designated in charge. So, so if it's a formal situation like that, then there is a designated uh, leadership and deployment. However, psychological first aid itself is just a means of communicating with people, so that you are. Um, you know, you, you can do this informally. I find myself using psychological first aid all the time informally, uh, just with friends or neighbors or you know, people that that I know and have, have communication with and, and no formal role there. So these are just a set of skills that are just really handy. I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. Yeah, and then um, we had a question from um, Stephanie at University of Washington. Who is wondering if you can suggest a short handout on the topic of um, psychological first aid, I'm assuming, or um, perhaps this issue broadly for uh, inclusion in a disaster plan, and if you have a favorite. So anything that succinctly kind of captures what you discussed today, Jody. I don't know that, I'm sure there is some shorthand um, presentation there somewhere. Um, I'm just not necessarily familiar with uh, one off the top of my head. There, I will tell you that if you if you go and look for the World Health Organization psychological first aid, there's a there's a fairly brief manual online that you can download for free that is um, very easy to to follow. And uh, there, there is, I just see Laura here found that there is an app also that you can put on your phone that assists you in walking through psychological first aid. Thank you, Laura, I've forgotten about that. So I appreciate you bringing that, that up. I, I have that actually on my iPad um, so that, I, that prompts me. So that, that's good. Thank you. And then we had another question um, from Helen who was noting that um, you said several times people uh, need an opportunity to tell their story. Uh, she says she feels it's also important to let people sit quietly um, for those who don't necessarily want to speak. Um, and just wondering if you agree with that sentiment and perhaps maybe some tips on how to handle that kind of silence. Yes, absolutely, Helen. Thank you for, um, for typing that. Uh, psychological first aid is really about allowing people to tell their story with with the uh, emphasis on allowing, <laughs> not making or insisting. Um, and sometimes people don't want to tell their story. And, and 
Um, let me give you an example that uh, that came up. So sometimes you may run across people who are sitting quietly, and you may come up to them and 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 ask them how they're doing or whatever, and they may indicate very well that they don't really want to talk to you. Now there's a difference um, if someone's visibly upset or you, you can tell that something's wrong a simple way to do that is to simply just ask if you can sit with them so for example in a family service center there was someone who was very upset they were very tearful um, we asked them if, if they wanted anything um, or if we could talk to them they said no um, so one of my responders just basically said, you know, I've been standing for a while. Do you mind if I just sit with you for a minute? And that's what they did. They just sat in silence. Silence is incredibly powerful. It so happened that in sitting, that person decided that they wanted to start talking because they got more comfortable with, with the responder's presence. Um, but it's, it's really about allowing. Uh, we as a society tend to equate doing with uh, meaningful and I can tell you one of the the nice things about psychological first aid is it's more about being it is incredibly powerful to be fully present with someone whether you're speaking or not um, it's it's it is probably the most powerful gift that that we can give each other and we don't do it very well anymore because we're always on our phones or something like that um, but don't underestimate to, to Helen's point um, respecting other people or just being physically present and available. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, um, Helen, for raising that question, Jody, for um, that very helpful answer. Um, so I'm seeing a little bit of typing happening. Um, okay, so Gary was just offering a suggestion for some other short resources. Yeah, I would encourage you all to continue to think about um, other ways to capture some of this information um, and just distribute it because I really do think this is um, an important part of the work that you all will be doing as responders, but I think it's also important for collecting institutions to consider in their disaster plans um, this component of the work of responding to events. Um, I realize we're getting close to uh, half after the hour, so I want to go ahead and just pull over the survey link for this program. Um, again, you all probably remember from the first webinar that we did, but if you could just click on this uh, link and click the Browse To button, it will take you to a SurveyMonkey uh, link. And if you could just take a couple of moments to complete that survey, it would be very helpful for us. Um, I want to go ahead and take this opportunity now as well to thank Jody for this really wonderful presentation. Um, I hope you all found this to be uh, valuable content. and. Um, I, again, am grateful to you all for your patience with the technical issues, um, but I will be following up with you all with information about next week's program. So we had a little break uh, for a few weeks there, but we're hitting the ground running. So we've got another webinar coming up in just a week. So you all will get an invitation for that shortly. Um, but again, thank you all for taking the time and um, thanks to Jody. Thank you uh, very much. I, I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to do this. You guys asked some great questions, by the way. Um, just uh, thanks for what you do, and thanks for your interest in this topic. So. All right, have a good one, everyone.